Today we continue to look at the prophecies of Daniel in the Revelation. And we want to know one question. How can these prophecies be fulfilled in my life and in my experience? I want to invite you to pray with me before we begin. We're looking today at the third angel, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Let us pray. Father in heaven, merciful God and Savior, we thank you so much. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you for the example of Jesus Christ in the flesh. And today, Lord, we ask that your spirit will draw near so that as we turn to your word, that your spirit will interpret all things to our minds. Forgive us of every sin. Give us focus and reception. Grant at the end of this study that your people will have a new experience, even an experience in Jesus Christ. Your word says that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. May we have the mind of Jesus, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the commandments of God and what we need to understand, we want to understand from the very inception that the objective of the gospel the objective of the third angel's message, the everlasting gospel, is the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So that, listen, we're going to look at Jesus on this earth, when he was on this earth. He teaches us what it means and what is required to keep the commandments of God. And so the question is, what is required that I may successfully keep God's commandments? What is required that I may overcome sin and self? Because sometimes when we talk about overcoming, we think of outward things. The first thing that we need to overcome is ourselves. So the objective of the third angel's message, the Bible tells us in Revelation 14, 12, it says, here is the patience of the saints. Praise the Lord. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So two things to be kept. The commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. I cannot keep the commandments of God without exercising the faith of Jesus. Even Jesus couldn't do it. On this earth, he exercised faith in his Father and that enabled him to obey his Father. And in doing that, he had exercised patience to wait on his Father. You see, God has time in, and this is something that we are understanding, we are learning the hard way. If you wait on God, then you need to wait on his time. Praise the Lord. God has time in. And so things don't happen according to your expectations. Remember Job? He had to wait for deliverance. He wanted deliverance before, but Job said, though he slay me, yet will I do what? Trust him. I have to wait on God. So you have to learn to wait on God. Look, the exercise of faith, even the faith that Jesus exercised, is essential to keeping the commandments of God. Push on. How does faith work? How does true faith work? The Bible tells us, Galatians 5, 6, for in Jesus Christ, the outward things, circumcision, nor uncircumcision, 
or sor circumcision, sorry, avail at nothing. But faith, this is what avails, which worketh by love. Faith works by love. Faith is trust in God. And you don't trust anybody who you don't love. So there is a, there must first of all be a love relationship between you and God. Hello? For you to be brought to that place whereby you can trust God because more, very often and up ahead of us will be trials sore. Crisis to come. We are asked to trust God in every crisis that is before us. That's why the Lord tells us in John 14, 15, He says, if you love me, because without love, we cannot keep God's commandments because keeping the commandments requires faith and trust. Faith which works by love. So I must have faith in God which works by love and that will enable me to keep the commandments of God. True obedience, therefore, is dependent upon a loving, trusting relationship with God. Amen? True faith will be manifested in a crisis. If you really trust God, when a crisis comes, you will trust Him. Revelation 15, 2, talking about the saints, the remnant. The Bible tells us, in Revelation 15, 2, God tells us that his people will be overcomers. Revelation 13 speaks of the mark of the beast and the image of the beast that will be set up. Revelation 15, 2 says, I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory Oh, praise the Lord. So prophecy tells us that God's people will be victorious. And it tells us what they will be victorious over. Them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name. They will stand on the sea of glass and they will sing and play their harps. In other words, they will be victorious and they will be rejoicing in the victory. But they must overcome as Christ overcame. Listen, the only true overcoming is to overcome as Christ overcame. Hello? So many times, very often, we will be tempted to believe that we have an experience in overcoming, Satan can fool you. Satan can fool you. He will not tempt you with a particular sin. And you think you overcome. And then later on, when you least expect, he brings the temptation so strong and overthrow your faith. We want to have true victory. Even the victory of Jesus Christ. And so the Bible tells us we are to overcome by the blood of the Lamb. This is how Christ overcame. Christ overcame by the blood that he shed. He resisted unto blood. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 12.4. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. So the people of God spoken of in Revelation 15.2 will overcome the beast and his image, his mark and his name, they were overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony and they will not be concerned about life. They will rather die than sin. Now they will do this because that was the experience of Jesus Christ. Jesus says to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame. In other words, Jesus is saying that those who overcome as I overcame will sit with me in my throne. <coughs> Excuse me. So Jesus is saying that the only overcoming is, is overcoming as I overcame. 
So the question is, how did Jesus overcome? Look at these points. Bible prophecy declares that men will be, men will be victorious over the beast and his image. Number two, they will overcome by the blood of the Lamb. We looked at this already. And by the word of their testimony. In other words, they will exercise faith. They will have a personal testimony in trusting God and experiencing victory. We just saw that they will overcome. They must overcome as Christ overcame. How did Christ overcome? By resisting unto blood. Hebrews 12. For when he resisted on the blood, he testified to the faithfulness of his father. In other words, his testimony was that my father can be trusted. Praise the Lord. My father can be trusted. The Bible tells us in Matthew 4, 2 to 4, look at the experience of Christ. When we talk about patience, we talk about waiting on God. But God has time in. The Bible says, when he had fasted 40 days. Imagine, after a long 40-day fast, Jesus could say, well, I went through the whole 40 days. I don't have to wait anymore. But the Bible says, on 40 nights, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He was afterward and hunger. The Bible says, when the tempter came to him. And this will be fall. The tempter comes to us after we have gone through an ordeal. He comes and he tempts us. He, he doesn't only tempt us, but he tells, he reasons with us. He says, you, you have already done enough. You don't have to do any more. You don't have to stand up now. You can drop arms. That's how Satan comes. Then they came to the Son of God. He said, if thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. In other words, forget every other principle and just go and make you because you deserve food. And yes, very often, it is the very thing that you're waiting on that Satan brings to you. It could be a husband. It could be a wife. It could be a job. It could be anything that you was desiring so bad. Satan brings up very thing. Wow. And you say, well, this is what I've been fasting for. This is what I've been praying for. It has to be from God. Jesus did not reason like that. Hello? Bible says... But Jesus answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread only. Wow. Hello? So man shall not live by the thing that you want so bad. Whatever it is. But by every word, oh praise the Lord, that proceeded. Out of the mouth of God. In other words, God has time in. Obedience to God requires faith and patience. Amen? Obedience to God requires faith and patience. Because as we saw, Revelation 14, 12, those who will overcome, in them will be developed the faith of Jesus. The Bible says here is the patience of the saints. The patience of the saints is demonstrated in commandment keeping by the faith of Jesus. These are pages 121, paragraph 1. When Christ said to the tempter, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, he repeated the words that more than 1,400 years before he had spoken to Israel. He spoke this to the Israel when they were in the wilderness. 
And, and imagine Christ is now in the wilderness and now he has to practice the same thing in the wilderness. Very often, remember, watch it, in the, it is in the wilderness that Satan comes. When you are in a bad place, struggling, that is when Christ, Satan comes. So that in the wilderness, when all means of sustenance failed, God sent his people manna from heaven and a sufficient and constant supply was given. What is that to teach? We are told this provision was to teach them that while they trusted in God, oh praise the Lord, listen, trusting in God is a serious, we need to understand what it means to trust God. We, we cannot be trusting God and trusting your own ways, your own self, your own ideas. And we have a lot of ideas. We have a lot of, of, of uh, um, understanding how to get things done. And God is saying, put that one side. We cannot trust God and trust our own ways. But when we are walking in God's ways and trusting in God, he will not forsake us. Praise the Lord. He will not forsake them. That was to teach them that lesson to teach us as well. Because all these things are written for our example. The end of the world has come upon us. These lessons are for you and I. You see, Christ was now about to practice obedience with patience. And so we are told, the Savior now practiced the lesson that he had taught Israel. By the word of God, succor had been given to the Hebrew host. And by the same word, it says, it will be given to Jesus. Listen, one of the ways we can honor God is by ensuring that whatever comes to us comes from God. You know Abraham? Abraham, when he was offered the spoil after the slaughter of the kings, he said, listen, I want none. He said, nobody must say that I made Abraham rich. I will not take from a shoe to a shoe latch it. We must love God so much. We must want to glorify God so much that only God must get the praise from what comes to us. We must be sure that what comes to us, what we receive, is coming straight from the hand of God. Praise the Lord. By his, by his leading, by his guidance, we arrive at these blessings. We must be so Willing for the, for the glory and honor of God. So willing for that. So the Savior now practiced the lesson he had taught to Israel. By the word of God, succor had been given to the Hebrew host. And by the same word, it would be given to Jesus. Listen, he awaited a God's time to bring relief. Oh, praise the Lord. God's time, believers. God's time. God has a time. So when we trust in God, especially when we, when we decide that we want to, we're going to obey God by the power of, of the Holy Spirit. Listen, we must be willing to wait. God has time in. So Christ awaited God's time to bring relief. He was in the wilderness in obedience to God. The Bible says that the Spirit led him into the wilderness. And he would not obtain food by following even the suggestions of Satan. We need to learn the voice of God. God speaks through people. Satan speaks through people too. But every child of God, every true sheep, knows the voice of God. In the presence 
of the witnessing universe. He testified. This is the testimony of Jesus. He testified that it is a less calamity to suffer whatever may befall than to depart in any manner from the will of God. Oh, praise the Lord. So this is the testimony of Jesus. Those who overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of the testimony will have the same testimony. They will love not their lives unto the dead. They will prefer to die rather than sin. God is saying, I can hold my, you can hold yourself together by the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and wait on God or rather die than sin. You don't have to sin. See, that God has not made us in a way that we have to fall apart because of human desires. Human desires are nothing. Put it under the blood. Jesus has power to give you victory over self. He made us. And in the plan of salvation, he's, he is the creator who is recreating us in the divine image in which he first made us. So we need to understand true commandment keeping. Only when this infinite trust and patience is learned. So we need to learn patience. Patience is something we need to learn. It doesn't come by chance. When this is learned, then we can keep the commandments. Then the commandments of God are kept. For those who take God's work into their own hands, that person has broken every commandment. When then you take God's work of providing for you in your own hands, you have broken the commandment. He's made himself God in the place of, of the Almighty. He's worshipped an image. He has taken the Lord's name in vain, calling himself a son of the Most High, when in fact, is betraying the Lord's name. Betraying the relationship. You can't be a son and still behaving as though God is not your father. What was the Sabbath principle? That violating the Sabbath principle because the Sabbath principle teaches us dependence upon God. It teaches us that God is the problem solver. He's the plan maker. He's the Burden bearer. And then you bear your own burdens. Solve your own problems. For he has dishonored his heavenly father. He's guilty of breaking the commandments. He's committed self-murder. Because he separates himself from the source of life. And God is no longer his source. He is his own source. We can't give ourselves life. He's committed spiritual adultery because he divorced himself from his spiritual husband. He's stolen the honor which belongs to God alone. Only God must get the honor, not even self must get the honor for what you have. He's borne false witness against his heavenly father's faithfulness. In other words, saying God the father is not faithful enough. So I had to provide for myself. He's coveted the position which belongs to the infinite God alone. James says, whoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all. So we talked about overcoming the beast and his image and that is why we always have to speak first of all of overcoming the beast inside of us. That's the beast inside of us that we just spoke about. When we finish talking about that and addressing that, then we can talk about the beast and his image. Then we can understand what the beast and his image is. 
The special characteristic of the beast, according to Great Controversy 446, paragraph 1, and his image is the breaking of God's commandments. When the thought comes to break the law, to violate the principles of the law, to do things for yourself, to stop depending on God, there's a beast right there. Commandment breaking. Daniel says of the little horn, the papacy, he shall think to change times and the law. Paul says that this same power, the man of sin, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, he was to exalt himself above God. It is only by changing God's law that a papacy is able to exalt himself above God. Look at self, look at us inside. Only when we, we violate the principles of the law of God, we exalt ourselves above God. We, we're functioning according to another law. A law that's in our own heads, that's, uh, uh, that functions according to our own ways. This is my way of doing it. Your way becomes your law. History and the Bible agrees that the only change ever made to the law of God was by Emperor Constantine in 383 21. That change was put into effect by 538 AD, beginning the 1260 years of papal persecution. It ended in, in 1798. So history tells us, when we're talking about changing the law of God and the power that changed the law, history tells us who did it. We don't have to argue. Early writing says the Pope has changed the day of rest from the seventh to the first day. Early writing 6 or 5, paragraph 1. But the law of God and the author of that law is unchangeable. So the law cannot be changed because the law reflects the love of God. And since the love of God does not change, much less an unchangeable, therefore, the law cannot be changed. Because it must always express who God is. He has thought to change the very commandment that was given to cause man to remember his creator. So Satan knows how to work to get our minds to turn away from God to self and to everything else. And then we begin to trust self and everything else. He has thought to change the greatest commandment in the Decalogue and thus make himself equal with God or even exalt himself above God. We are told the Lord is unchangeable, therefore his law is immutable. Wow. Bible tells us, therefore the third angel brings a warning. This warning is not to condemn anybody. This warning is to, is to bring us, to draw us to attention, to bring us to a decision that we may experience the righteousness and salvation that is brought to us in Jesus Christ. The Bible says, the third angel followed, saying with a low voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark and his fur in his hand, all of those things that we are to overcome. The Bible warns us, if we don't overcome them, what will happen to us? The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. So what is the third angel's message? Is worship or damnation? It's up to you. The third angel's message is connected to the first angel's message. It is all a part of the everlasting gospel. The first angel's message saves men in one way, and that is by drawing them to the love of God in Christ. We are told this in 1 Thessalonians 
2 Thessalonians 2.10. That should be 2 Thessalonians 2.10. They did not receive the love of God that they would be saved. The love of God is to save. It saves us by presenting the glory of God for worship, which is not possible. Worship is not possible without love and adoration. I cannot worship God if I don't have love for Him, if I don't adore Him, I don't see Him as the most supreme object in my life. He must be first. That's worship. Putting him first. And the Bible says if you don't come to this point, only those who receive not the love of the truth, who do not come to this point, will be left to damnation. According to 2 Thessalonians 2.10. They did not receive the love of the truth, and therefore they experience damnation. Fire and brimstone. They choose that for themselves. God is not choosing that for us. God is warning us. Revelation 38, therefore, shows us the, the, the look. The, we have the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. Two governments, two kingdoms. Two different principles of operation. We saw just now that God works by love. He draws us by love, by his love. So by the revelation of love, God draws men to him, to save them. But the Bible tells us in Revelation 38, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, the beast, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, that was slain from the foundation of the world. Why? Because Satan does not ask questions. You don't have to make a decision to worship him. Once you refuse to worship God, he will force you to worship him. These are pages 759, paragraph 1. Compelling power is found where? Only under Satan's government. So once you're not in the government of God, you don't have to ask, you don't, so you don't ask you a question. You will be compelled to worship the beast. Or if you will be compelled to depend on your own ways, your own ideas, your own self. You will lose patience with God. We don't have time to wait on God. He takes too long. And that's the conclusion of many today. The Lord's principles are not of this order. God's authority rests upon goodness, mercy, and truth. God's government is moral. And truth and love are the prevailing power in the government of God. Wow. So the biblical principle, we can now talk about this principle. No man can serve to masters. You see, our minds, the human mind, is not capable of holding two opposing powers in high esteem, the same high regard. I cannot hold Satan as my supreme and hold God as my supreme. They are two opposing powers. Two different principles antagonistic to each other. We cannot serve God and mammon at the same time. So anytime I reject light, what am I doing? I'm choosing darkness. I'm making a choice. I don't have to make the, the choice deliberately, but I reject light, I've chosen. Praise the Lord. Referring to Herald November 5, 1895, paragraph 9, this is what it says. The rejection of light Leaves men where? In darkness. The invitation which the Jews refused 
was sent to the poor, the maimed, the hot, the blind. The precious message has come to you and I in these last days. Warnings and entreaties have sounded. And the question is, shall men and women whom God has blessed, you know, look at our people sometimes, God has blessed and built you up, made you who you are today. Will you allow Satan to deceive you and take your good self and give it to the devil? And we're doing that a lot today. Allowing ourselves to be deceived by the enemy of our souls. There is a result for those who will accept the message. And there's a different result for those who will reject the message of the third angel. For those who receive the message, it will develop in them the patience and faith of Jesus. Praise the Lord. The Bible tells us, 1 Peter 1, 7, that the trial of what? Your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perish it. Though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at what? At the appearing of Jesus Christ. So when Jesus comes, you will be ready. Your faith will be like gold. But the results of rejection, we are told, 2 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12, for this cause, for rejecting the message, listen, God shall send them strong delusion. What strong delusion? God leads them to the delusions which they prefer to listen to. That they should believe a lie. That they all might be what? Might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in our righteousness. So you reject the truth, and God says, okay. It's all right. If you reject the truth that speaks of salvation, eternal life in the kingdom of God, you will like Cain, Cain abandon the promise and went and built a city. This world now becomes your home because you don't have no hope of heaven anymore. The Bible says if any man loved the world, the love of the Father. He's lost the love of the Father. He's given up. He's abandoned the promises. Revelation 13, 17, that no man may bear sell. This is the persecution that's inevitable. The trial of your faith. This is what it talks about. Peter says the trial of your faith. No man might buy or sell, so you will, be, you will be cut off from this world. But the Bible says, your faith will be more precious in the end, because it will be like gold when Christ appears. You will not be able to buy or sell if you don't have the mark of the, or the name of the beast or the number of his name. The Bible says in Revelation 13, 15, he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. The final crisis is a life and death issue. The crisis before the people of God is a life and a death and death issue. It is for you to decide and the decision has to be made today. Letter 57, 1896, I'm quoting. It says, the proclamation of the third angel's message, which in actual fact is the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus, is the great burden of our world. That is what we, or that's the emphasis of the work of, of God's people. What's the secret of overcoming the beast? The secret to overcoming the beast and his image is a union through communion with Jesus. 
The farthest I can keep from Satan is the closest I can get to Jesus Christ. We are to love him and depend upon him. We are to develop a love for his truth. And the word tells us Christ, the living word of God, is also the truth. Amen? We come down. These are pages 3 to 4. Pay close attention as we close with these two paragraphs. It says, the only defense against evil, therefore, secret to overcome and listen, the only defense against evil is the indwelling. This is the closest I can get to Christ. This, this is where the disciples were after Christ went back to heaven. He was even closer to them. He dwelt in them. You can't get closer than that. The only defense against evil is the indwelling of Christ in the heart through faith in his righteousness. Unless we become vitally connected with God through the surrender of ourselves moment by moment to him, we shall be overcome. This is not maybe. And I speak to myself. Without a personal acquaintance with Christ, and a continual daily communion. We are at the mercy of the enemy. And the shall do his bidding. Why don't see any maybes here? This is clear. Further. Listen, you can be held by the power of love. The same love that is revealed in Christ to draw the sinner to him can hold the sinner and keep him from falling. Inspiration continues. It says, when the soul surrenders itself to Christ, a new power takes possession of the new heart. So there's a new power and a new heart. And listen, a change is wrought which man can never accomplish for himself. It is a supernatural work, bringing a supernatural element into human nature. The soul that is yielded, listen, to Christ becomes his own fortress, which he holds in a revolted world. And Christ, he Christ intends that no authority shall be known in it but his own. And the authority of Christ is love. The power of love. You know what? Love is the strongest force in the universe. When men turn from sin as sweet as it is and give it up, and give the life to Jesus Christ. It is the love of God that breaks every chain. We can also be held by the power of force and dominion. God, watch it. But unless we do yield ourselves to the control of Christ, we shall be dominated by the wicked one. Dominated by the wicked one. Forced. It is not necessary for us, we saw this before, to deliberately choose the service of the kingdom of darkness in order to come under its power or its dominion. We have only to neglect to ally ourselves with the kingdom of light. That's all we have to do. If we do not cooperate with the heavenly agencies, Satan will take possession of the heart and will make it his abiding place. Wow. Therefore, we need to learn to see in the word of God both a command and a promise. Praise the Lord. When we look at the word of God from here onwards, we must see a command but also a promise. 
All of God's biddings are enablings. Oh, praise the Lord. So the word tells us, even in this life, and this is based on the example of Christ. This is based on the example that Christ left on record. So we can have the testimony of Jesus. Even in this life, it is not for our good to depart from the will of our Father in heaven. So even think about heaven, even in this life. Much as heaven. When we learn the power of his word, praise the Lord. Believers, this is the problem. We are not learning the power of the word of God. We need to learn the power of the word. When we learn the power of the word, we will not hesitate to trust God, you know. Satan will not scare us into hesitancy. And very often Satan scares us when we meet a trial like as though if we, we will die. If we don't commit a sin. If we don't compromise, we will die. Listen. We need to learn the power of the word. Every command is a promise. So when we learn the power of, his, of God's word, we shall not follow the suggestions of Satan in order to obtain food or to save our lives. In, in other words, there's nothing that you want that Satan can suggest his way for you to get it. You will learn God's way and stick to God's way and wait on God's timing. And you will know that in God's time, it will be done. Praise the Lord. Our only question will be, what is God's command and what his promise? What is the command that God has given? Because right there in the command is the promise. So we need to study the word of God. Those who will obey God must study the word of God. Satan didn't come to Christ with a clear word. He quoted scripture and misquoted purposely. The word of God has to be studied. So we can, we can see the command and the promise in the command. And then the question will be answered. What is God's command and what is his promise? Knowing these, we shall obey the command and trust the promise. Oh, hallelujah. We shall obey the one and trust the other. So that every time you obey the command of God, you can be sure of God's salvation. Praise the Lord. You can be sure of God's providence. Obedience will bring the blessing. Whatever is God's will. This is what God is bringing us to. Whatever is his will. Will it be done? That's what Christ came to in Gethsemane. Not my will, but thy will be done. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God has a will in heaven. He's bringing us in harmony with that will so that through us it will be accomplished on earth. That's what we mean by fulfilling the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. It is the people of God through whom God will fulfill and bring everything to pass. Through, through his people and their, their commitment and loyalty to God. This is where God is bringing us. May we allow him to bring us to this point. Is my prayer for each one of us. May God bless you. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, merciful God and Savior, again this afternoon, as we tabernacle with you, Father, you have spoken to our hearts, and we believe. We ask, O oh Lord, that you may give us the faith of Jesus. 
Because it's only as you give us the faith of Jesus that we can keep the commandments of God. In the past, we've tried on our own. We've failed time and time again. The fact that we are here is evidence that we have not given up. But we are tired. We are tired of our own way. May we learn the way of Jesus. May we embrace God's way and experience the victory of Christ. Oh, hallelujah. May God bless each one of us. May you have mercy upon us, Lord. Give us determination that by your grace we will remain faithful unto the end. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.